Friends, would you pray with me and for me as we spend time coming towards his word today? Lord, this series has been amazing. We have seen numbers of people who have encountered you, Jesus, and had their lives transformed. So our request, even now, 2,000 years later, is that by pouring into the text, by being with one another in your presence, that our lives would be transformed with an encounter with you this morning. Lord, this story is familiar to us. So in some senses, there may be a bit of complacency in us, but I pray that it would be fresh. I pray that it would be uh, as hard hitting as that video, that we would recognize what you, the life that you have for us that's found in Christ and found in what it means to be a neighbor. So come Lord Jesus and speak. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Well, you've heard the phrase before, there are no stupid questions, but all you have to do is spend a few minutes on the internet to know very quickly that we would beg to differ. Here's just a few. I could have made list after list after list, but somebody actually put on the internet, what was Obama's last name? Or how long does it take to get from Miami to Florida? Or should I tell my parents I'm adopted? Does it take 18 months for twins to be born? And the list goes on and some of them you don't want to hear, but you get the point. There are sometimes stupid questions and believe it or not, sometimes they come from people who are, are trying to cause tension. You know, in this encounter series, we've seen all kinds of people. We've been challenged for a number of weeks with people's lives who have been transformed. And we want to be able to, again, look today and be able to say, uh, Lord, come and transform us as we look at this encounter between a Jewish lawyer who, in a sense, asks a very stupid question, and he's doing it because he's trying to trap Jesus. We want our lives to be transformed. This conversation between the lawyer and Jesus, it, it hits so close to home because he's rationalizing. He's rationalizing his behavior. And some of the rationalizations he makes probably, well, we need to pay attention to them in our own lives. So come with me to Luke chapter 10. Sophia did such a great job of reading it. I'm going to just read it piece by piece as we go so we can pay attention. I, I invite you to keep your finger in the text. It's on the screen, but of course, it's also good to have your Bibles open and be paying attention. So here's how Jesus begins to tell the story. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus, re Jesus replied, do this and you will live. Conversation between a religious leader, a Jewish lawyer, so to speak, and Jesus. Now we've seen all kinds of times already in the Gospel of Luke that religious leaders or Pharisees always were trying to find a way to trap Jesus. And here's what, round one of the conversation. I want you to picture yourself being in a courtyard typically the teacher would be sitting. So on this occasion, Jesus is sitting and he's having a conversation, beginning to ask questions of the audience. Somebody would stand up in response and would give an answer. This lawyer instead stands up because he has an attitude. This is his opportunity. This is his opportunity to actually be the big shot in the story and to come back to Jesus. And so he stands up, and you could tell by his tone, he's not answering a question Jesus has asked. He's, he's pushing against Jesus. What do I do to inherit eternal life? Well, that's his first stupid question. You and I both know there's nothing you can do to inherit anything. You don't inherit things because of something you've done. You inherit things because of who you are and how much you're loved or how much you belong, how much you're part of the family. 
but this question's even dumber than we first anticipate. It gets worse. You see, implicit in the question is the idea that life to the fullest is all wrapped up in keeping the law. Jesus, what do I do? Says the religious teacher to inherit eternal life. How do I keep the law so that I can get in? Actually, it even goes worse. Because implicit in that is this sense of what's the bare minimum I can do? What's the bare minimum I can get away with and still be okay? See, what happened with the Jews is there was a written law and then an oral law, an oral law that was meant to interpret how little do we need to do and actually still be okay? So the confrontation's been had. Jesus responds. Uh, the Jewish lawyer is trying to suck him into a confrontation, right? But Jesus is too smart for that. So his simple response is, well, you're a lawyer. You're a religious leader. What does it say? You know the law backwards and forwards. So what does it say? And then he, he asks another question. How do you read it? See, Jesus doesn't get sucked into this, this power play back and forth. The Jewish lawyer expects him to give a list, do this, do this, do this, do this, or to actually say, keep the whole law. But no, Jesus says, what does it say? And how do you read it? Now, at first glance, it seems to us that there might be uh, the same question asked twice. Not so. Actually, what Jesus is doing is saying, well, you know the law. So tell me what it says. And then the second part of the question, he says, but do you do it? Uh, uh, it's one thing to know it. It's another thing to act on it. Well, the Pharisee wants to dialogue. He wants to keep pushing. And so he answers Jesus's question. He knows what the law says. Love God, love your neighbor. He knows that if you go back to the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you get all of that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. And he adds Leviticus to that. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it's possible that he's heard Jesus teaching on this in the past. Either that or he summed up the law very well. You see, we learn to love God by learning to love our neighbor. He knew it. But the big question is, did he live it? Did he do it? So Jesus responds. And you'll notice that the lawyer asks question one. Jesus asks question two. The lawyer answers question two. And now Jesus answers question one. You're correct. Mm -hmm. Do this and you will live. Mm -hmm. See, what Jesus is doing is he's imploring the Pharisee. To not just know it, but to live it. But there's something else. See, the Pharisee in this moment would have known, as the whole crowd would have known, that we can't possibly do all that in our own strength. See, to inherit eternal life, which in the Old Testament was often associated with living well, living at peace in the land. To inherit eternal life, to love our neighbor, to love God with everything that we have, well, we're always going to fall short. So what's Jesus doing? Jesus is telling this Pharisee, you're asking the wrong question. It's not the right question. You've missed the whole scene. Well, come with me, just pause for a second, and let's consider a couple of points that I think come out of just this first round of conversation that we would do well to pay attention to. You know, our religious systems will never lead us to life. It's never in being good enough. It's never in accomplishing certain things. That doesn't make God love us anymore. No, we have to understand it's not our religious system. It's God's grace. His mercy towards us, his strength in us. It's his grace that leads us to life. How many of us 
how many of us know the right answers to so many questions. We know how to dot I's, cross T's. We know how to give doctrinally correct statements, and yet we fail to act. Or worse. Which of us are guilty? Guilty of asking what's the minimum I can do and get away with? Friends, isn't that the tithing question? What's the minimum I can give and still be okay? That's what the Pharisee was asking. Jesus wanted to tease out of him so much more. Life is not found in doing religious things. Life is not even found in the practices that we keep. No. Life is found in this total submission to him where we don't just know things, we actually begin to act on them. When we can't act in our own strength, we act because it's Christ that lives within us. All right, so I've asked us a couple questions, but we should hold our tongues in response, or we risk becoming like the Pharisee, who immediately tries to justify himself. Come with me into round two as we begin to go a little bit further into verse 29 in the text. Luke points out he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? You can picture the courtyard scene. There you are sitting amongst all the people. The Jewish lawyer has stood up in response to Jesus's question. He's tried to have a go at Jesus. They've gone back and forth. Jesus has been gentle. You'd think it was finished. You'd think the guy would sit down and be quiet. But no, no, he, it's not good enough. It's not finished. All right, round one to Jesus. But no, I'm going to come back at you, Jesus. And who is my neighbor, he says. He can't help himself. He knows in full reality, he knows the law, but he also knows that he doesn't keep it. The second question is just as ridiculous as the first one. Why? because it implies there's a non-neighbor. It implies that there are some who are neighbors and some who are not neighbors. One of the problems in those days for the Jews, who, who's my neighbor? Well, for Jews, of course, other Jews were neighbors. Of course, family, priests, all that, they were neighbors. Proselytes, those who had uh, started outside but become Jewish in their customs and culture, uh, maybe, maybe we they could fit in the neighbor category, but Gentiles, no chance. Gentiles are not neighbors, and Samaritans, no, 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 they're they're worse than Gentiles. The oral law was a fence around the real law that was meant to tell people: Are you in or are you out? Are you a neighbor or not a neighbor? You could, have, you could have felt the tension in the crowd as this interchange was going back and forth. And so how's Jesus going to respond? Well, once again, with all wisdom, instead of giving an answer, he, in his customary format, asks a question in return. He wants to tease out again from the Pharisee the real answer that comes to life. You're asking the wrong question again. So he starts by telling a story. Listen to verse 30 as Jesus begins to tell this parable. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. I'm not sure how many of you have seen pictures of the road from Jerus Jerusalem to Jericho. 17 miles of danger as you wind your way down. There's tension amongst the crowd as Jesus tells the story. A man's heading from Jerusalem to Jericho. Uh-oh, not a good road, dangerous. He's robbed. Yeah, we thought that might be coming. He's stripped and beaten and left half dead. It wasn't unusual. It would happen a lot. It was a desolate road, and it was very easy for thieves to come upon people who were traveling down. It was always much better to travel in crowds. But why does Luke tell us? 
Why does Jesus include in the story that he's been stripped, beaten, and is half dead? Well, it makes it impossible to tell what kind of a man he is, whether he's a Jew or a Gentile. He can't speak, so you can't tell his dialect. He has no clothes on, so you can't tell his fashion. Maybe even by being beaten and half dead, you're not even sure what skin color he has. Implicit in Jesus beginning to tell this story of this man that's beaten, underneath all of that, Jesus is getting at asking the question back to the Pharisees. So what do you think? Is this guy a neighbor? The answer is, don't know. Keep going in verse 31. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Pay attention to a couple of the details. It says the priest was going down the same road, saw the man, passed by on the other side. Well, the audience, the crowd, the people listening to Jesus that day, they, this would have been familiar as well, because priests often lived in Jericho, and they would head up the road to Jerusalem and spend their two weeks on duty in the temple. And now this guy was going home. Priests were wealthy, and so he's likely riding on a donkey. It says he approaches on the road and sees the body. Don't know who it is. Don't know what kind of person. Not even sure if he's alive. So what's going on inside the priest at that moment is, is tension filled. It's, do I do something? Do I care for this person? Hmm. I've been away from the family for a while. I'm on my way home. If I go near him and touch him and he's dead, I'll be defiled. I'll need to turn around. I'll go back up to Jerusalem where I'll have to quarantine for a week and do the purification rites. I'll be away from my family. Or worse yet, I may even... Well, I may even be called on the carpet by my peers. I may get put on uh, probation. I may lose my job. Everything in him is all thinking about what's going on with him, what's best for him. Besides, the oral law said there was no obligation to help non-neighbors. And that guy on the road, that dead guy, well, almost dead guy maybe, he might not even be a Jew. He might not even be a neighbor. And so why do I need to help? And so steers the donkey around and goes by on the other side. Jesus raises the tension. Verse 32, he says, so too a Levite, when he came to that place, saw him passed by on the other side. Again, notice the details. It's not just when he came down the road. It says when he came to that place saw him he too passed by on the other side now levite was probably following the priest down the road he could probably see ahead of him far enough to see that the priest was there on his donkey but the levite would have been walking a little less a little lower in the socioeconomic scale the text says as jesus tells the story that he approaches the place meaning he came closer to the body than the priest did that was okay because according to the law, the Levite could get closer. Law was not as strict for the Levites. He's actually allowed to help non-neighbors. But he too has a decision. He too must have been feeling that inner tension. He could still defile himself if the man was dead and he couldn't tell. But worse than that, if the Levi went and helped this man, the same man that the priest had passed by, now he would be showing up the priest. There's a pecking order even in the Jewish religious system. If this priest deemed the man not to be a neighbor, who was he, the Levite, to question? Well, Jesus isn't finished. And he raises the tension even another stake higher. Verse 32, 33, he says this. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. At this point, the crowd would have been uh, visibly upset, audibly upset. You see, the crowd expected if there's a priest and a Levite, then there better be a Jew next. But no, 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 Jesus skips right past all of that throws a monkey wrench and goes straight to the Samaritan. The priest went down the road. The Levite went to the place. 
The Samaritan, it says in the story, went to the man. Oh, the Samaritan's not bound by any Jewish law. He has no reason to care about defilement. He's in Judean territory, and he has no obligation whatsoever. It's likely a Jew anyways. So why would a Samaritan care for a Jew? Jesus shows incredible courage by telling the story. The crowd actually now would have been getting mad. The Samaritan, less than a Gentile, the Samaritan is being made to be the hero. And what Jesus is doing by telling this story in this manner is showing who he is. Big fancy word. It's a Christological statement. He's telling the crowd who he is. Verse 34, he continues, he says, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. So here's the Samaritan, the hero of the story. What does he do? He bandages the wounds and pours oil. Seems backwards, doesn't it? Don't you think you'd clean out the wound first before you bandage it? Scholars are a little bit mixed on this. Some say it is backwards, but it's backwards on purpose. Others say, mm, not so. Sometimes it happened that way. See, what the Samaritan does is he does what the, the Levite failed to do. He took care of the man's wounds right on the road. He used all of his available resources to care for this man right then and there. Friends, this is a picture of Jesus. And what he does for every single one of us. It comes straight from Jeremiah 30, Hosea chapter 6, where it actually talks about the fact that Christ binds our wounds and then pours oil and wine on them to clean them. It's the precise order that was talked about about the Messiah. The scripture continues and it says, Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. See, by bandaging his wounds, he did what the Levite didn't do. By putting him on his donkey and taking him to an inn and caring for him, he did what the priest would not do. Transports the injured man. He leads the donkey, shows himself to be a servant, once again Christological, or once again revealing to the whole crowd who he is. Well, come with me to verse 35, and we come to the conclusion of the story. It says, the next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have had. What does he do? He pays the debt. He undoes what the thieves have done. The thieves took all his money, and now the Samaritan pays the debt for which the injured man could not pay. He pays. He stays, again, signs of being a servant, again, signs of being the promised one. He risks his own safety. Can you imagine the tension that was in the crowd? Can you imagine the tension around a fact that a Samaritan, a Samaritan is carrying a half-dead body of a Jew into a Jewish town? He's putting himself in incredible danger. The town would have wanted his head. And by saying, by telling this story, Jesus is making harsh accusations against the Jews. The story's finished. Jesus turns once again to the religious leader, the lawyer, the Jewish lawyer, and he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. This is round two. And if you remember just a few minutes ago, we see the Pharisee at the beginning of round two asking his second stupid question, who is my neighbor? Now Jesus is asking a question in response. Who was the neighbor? Or which was my neighbor? Uh, are you a neighbor, Mr. Pharisee? See, once again, the Pharisees ask the wrong question and is forced to answer in a way that implicates himself. The Pharisee answers, the mercy giver, of course. Friends, he has no choice. He has no choice but to answer this way in front of the whole crowd who are upset. There are huge implications in the way that he's answered. 
You see, both the oral law and its interpretation of the law were sufficient to them. But now they know it's not enough. Our law and the oral law are insufficient. In other words, being religious is not enough. It must lead to transformation. It must lead to action. Otherwise, you've missed the whole point. So now Jesus answers his question. Be a neighbor. Not who is my neighbor, but are you a neighbor? So go and do it. Go and do this and live. Once again, Jesus knew the impossibility of anyone doing this, anyone keeping up to these standards, except in the power of Christ. Well, we need to quit. You remember after round one, I drew our attention to a couple of points that were important for us to listen to. Religious system will never lead us to life. God's grace is what does. How many of us know the right answer and yet fail to act? And how many of us are guilty of asking the religious question, what's the minimum amount I can do and get away with it? May I add just one thing at this point? You know, in our early days of Southside, people were drawn to Southside because there was this incredible desire within us. We didn't get it right all the time, but there was an incredible desire within us. We were called by God to go into neighborhoods, make a difference. Lots of reasons over the last number of years, in a sense, I think we've pulled our foot off the pedal but I'm excited. I'm excited about these days because as we've talked about for the last couple of years, we've been on our heels, we've moved to our toes and I see us taking signs of actually beginning to move forward. But this is a moment. This is a story. This is an encounter where we have to stop and we have to say, we have to ask the hard questions. Are we actually putting our faith into practice? It's one thing to know it. It's another thing to live it. So come with me just for a minute. And what do we need to learn from round two? What are the points that for us to listen to in round two? I think there's just a couple. How do I say this with grace? Friends, we have to stop rationalizing. Far too often we come up with far too many excuses why we don't act as neighbors. The study guide, I told the story of what happened to me on New Year's Eve, it's Shelly and my anniversary. I'm out to get food and meet this guy who's got nowhere to sleep. And I just didn't want to deal with it. I wanted to go home. I wanted to be with Shelly. But the spirit was speaking. Now, this was one of the stories, one of the times when I actually listened. I don't all the time. I come up with all kinds of rationalizations in my head. And I'm not sure how you rationalize. Maybe we... I don't know if the guy really needs help. I'm not sure who he is. I'm not sure if he'll rob me. I'm not sure I'll get sick if I go near him. I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if it's any of my business. I'm not sure if someone else can do it for me instead. I'm tired. I've had a long day. The other person walked by. I, I, I'm not different than the other person. We come up with all these rationalizations for why we are not neighbors. I think the second thing is that we get caught up like the Pharisee and asking the wrong questions. We need to ask the right question. It's not who's my neighbor or, you know, who, who do I care for? Who do I not care for? It's, am I a neighbor? If Christ dwells within us, then, then we have no choice. But to not just obey the law, but to live it out to its fullest. It's not a minimum standard. It's rather, has my life been transformed by Christ so that it's not just good deeds that I do every once in a while when I feel prompted. It's the norm. It's the pattern of our lives that my life is given in pursuit of the other. It's not about dotting I's, crossing T's. It's not about getting our doctrine right all the time. It's about learning to be a blessing. It's learning to dwell in the neighborhood in such a way that everything that is mine, I will use every resource I have for the sake of the other. Because as Christ invites us, we're seeking the peace and the prosperity of the place to which he sent us. Thirdly, 
we have to get past this idea of being service providers and become stakeholders. I see progress. I see us moving in the right direction. This is not about us who are in a position of power doing some good deeds to those who aren't. This is about us. The same as everybody else. Learning to live in and amongst. One of the beautiful parts of this story is that there's always two neighbors. The Samaritan's a neighbor and the man who was beaten is a neighbor. And sometimes we play the role of the Samaritan and sometimes we're the one who was beaten and we need to learn to receive. So we move into neighborhoods, not because we've got all the answers. We move into neighborhoods because Christ is in us and he gives us the power to live in and amongst so that we can listen and we can follow. Last one. We don't just do good deeds. We don't just practice it. We need to learn to proclaim. All the way through this story, we hear Christological overtones Oh, for sure, the Samaritan is the hero. For sure, the Samaritan is the one who, in this sense, does all that the religious people will not do. It's good news to bind the wounds of those who are hurting. Good news to put them on your donkey. Good news to pay for their care. But the good news is not complete. Unless we point to the king of this new kingdom to which we belong. Oh, the Samaritan was the least expected, for sure. So was Jesus. He was not expected, but he is the one. The Samaritan is the outcast. So was Jesus. The Samaritan is the one who saved the man. As Jesus is the one who saves us. Friends, we do good deeds. But we also must learn to proclaim that Jesus is the one who offers us grace. Will you bow for a word of prayer with me? Lord, we confess to you that way too often, way too often we're asking what is the least we can do and still be okay. Way too often we're rationalizing in our minds ways in which we can live in our comfort. We can keep for ourselves what we think we have. Instead of having a posture, turning outward and saying, Lord, how can you use me in the midst of this place? Way too often, Lord, we're comfortable in our religious systems. Oh, Lord, would you hear our cry this morning that you would turn us into a people who live not for ourselves, but live for your glory, live for your kingdom, and therefore live in every manner, in every way, for the sake of the peace and the prosperity of the places to which you've sent us, so that we might indeed see all kinds of people healed and restored to you. We pray that you would hear our prayer this morning. We know that we have a long way to go, but we believe that it's not in our strength, not because we will do it because we're trying harder. It's because of the fact that you dwell in us. So come, Lord Jesus, we pray this in your name and for your kingdom's sake. Amen. Friends, we're going to hear a song played any second, and I am going to invite you to take the bread and the cup in your homes. The bread that Jesus took on the night that he was with his disciples, he broke it, and he said, this is my body that's given for you. And I want to invite us as we're eating the bread while we're listening and singing the song that we receive his invitation to join him, to join him in what it means to be sent into neighborhoods and to be good neighbors, that we might actually be the hands and feet of Jesus, the Samaritan who came in the midst of, instead of all the religious systems, offered himself, put himself at incredible risk, gave of everything that he had, so that the beaten one might live, and that's us. We take the bread and we celebrate that he's invited us to participate in what he's doing, and we take the cup. Jesus took the cup on the night that he was with his disciples, and he said, as you drink this, remember 
This symbolizes my blood, which is poured out for you. Mercy that restores you to the Father. Friends, we cannot, we cannot make a difference on our own. We cannot keep the law on our own. We cannot be neighbors, the kind of neighbors that he invites us to be on our own, but we can because of his mercy. His power lives in us because of this cup. Let us eat the bread, drink the cup as we sing this song and move towards a close. Let's eat and drink together.